There we go. It's <laughs> better. So, welcome to Babbling Zoom. Uh, I wanted to talk about the, the Wonder Woman problem. So, I think uh, there's this one meme that I ended up seeing a while back. Um, sorry, I've got a cat up here. If you hear it, sorry. <laughs> uh, there's this one meme that's been bugging me. Uh, where uh, they talk about how every supervillain starts the movie off by dropping a stack of paper. And yeah, I mean, it's a annoying trope. I get it. This is not the meme. I couldn't find it, but this is kind of similar to the idea of it. I want to talk about that situation with Barbara in Wonder Woman. Because I think it's something we've so used to seeing in a trope that we kind of just ignore it like the moment it happens we just kind of automatically simplify what the character's arc is going to be and we kind of ignore a lot of things and i think that's what we've been seeing in wonder woman a lot of people just ignored wonder woman and just basically put what they thought they they assumed what the movie was going to be about in the first 15 minutes Actually, I say first 30 minutes, to be honest. And let me show you. Just on this principle alone, right? So, sliding this over. We're bringing back the three-ox story structure. Should I show you what's going on? Majority of these, vill of these villains, Catwoman, Poison Ivy, uh, I can't remember his name, <laughs> Electro, um, Riddler. The key thing about all these villains is that within the first act, we see them change. As usual, uh, yeah, they drop the stack of papers, which is the key, um, to show how nerdy they are. Then they go through their change when the problem arises. And by the end of that, they become the villain. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Villain. Oh, I did it again. Let me add it. All right. So that's what happens with all these main characters over here. Think about it. Catwoman. Oh, let me do that. Catwoman's whole thing is just, I'm in her trying to uh, deal with the better looking, or no, not the better looking. Uh, Catwoman's deal is she's just beside herself, can't actually, uh, I don't know if she can't focus or anything, but she's just kind of like slightly scattered. Uh, and then when she finds out that the bad guy's doing, one of the bad guys is doing something, she's thrown out the window within the first 30 minutes. Ivy's lab gets destroyed first 15 minutes, uh, first 30 minutes. Uh, he's just shunned at a gala. Not really much of a villain thing, just standard evil. He wants to better. He wants to be better than Bruce Wayne. Uh, yeah, Riddler wants to be better than Bruce Wayne, or Enigma wants to be better than Bruce Wayne, and does the whole machine to make him smarter. Becomes the villain. 
right? Electro. To be honest, he's the worst defender of all the school best because he's truly a nerd. He's like the stereotypical nerd as opposed to everyone else is pretty bad. Everyone's bad, but this is this is the one that was horrible. <laughs> like true fanboy, horrible nerd, like what you think of, right? Again, he gets shocked by the, in the first 30 minutes and he's done. Barbara's a special case. And here's why. By the time you hit act two, with all these other characters, they're already a villain. Barbara's not a villain until the very end of act two. So let's recap, shall we? Within the first 15 minutes of the movie, we've established a few things. One woman's running around, or we do the, the flashback. We do the flashback of um, Diana. And it's important that we focus on the fact that it's Diana. This is a Diana story, all right? Yes, I know it's Wonder Woman. I know the whole thing is Wonder Woman. But it's really about Diana's personal story, right? We did a flashback of Diana into the present day or into the day of 1984, which is overly cheesy because again, we've had the only Wonder Woman TV show. There's a lot of cues in this, in this movie. Look at her run again, and then go back and watch the, uh, the original Wonder Woman movie. And the, amount, the, the surprising way she could change her clothes. Watch the original Wonder Woman TV show. She spins. She doesn't have to spin in this one. She just automatically takes her clothes off and all of a sudden, mag magically, boom, clothes. Yeah, I know you guys wanted realism. This is a superhero show. Pretending to be in the 80s. Really, come on. So, within the first 15 minutes, we have a flashback of Diana, a quick little montage of, super, of Wonder Woman saving everyone, and then we have the mall scene, which apparently a lot of people think is useless, a pointless little moment in the movie. Then we cut to after beating them all, we cut to I can't spell Barbara. Whatever. <laughs> we, we cut to Barbara's uh, ent intro. And within this one moment, there's so much told. She drops a stack of papers, obviously. But the moment after that, where someone comes up and says, hey, do you know the new girl? We, are inst we instantly realize that the reason people don't know her name or remember her name is because she just started a week ago. She's one week into the job. Let's go back to here for a second. Everyone in here is a respected person who's been working on the job for years, with the exception of Barbara. Barbara just started a week ago. She's the new girl. Hence why no one remembers her name. This is the trope that bugs me. Everyone around here and everyone in this page is a forgotten person because it's a trope being used over and over again. All these people have worked the job for so many years and it's just one of those people in the background that no one pays attention to. The difference is these, all these other uh, villains and think of countless villains that's been here before have been 
marginalized by not marginalized, but you know, just kind of the forgotten guy in the background. No one pays attention to. That's a trope that's annoying. Barbara's new. It is common. It's a totally makes sense for the new person, the new for the boss to forget the new person's name because there's too many people in the business in the job to focus on. It's the new girl who's also competent, by the way, because the moment we're introduced in a new girl who's just been there for a week, she automatically gets the big job of checking out something for the FBI. She's not a moron like every other supervillain in this show, in this trope. She's instantly giving, uh, given an interesting job. And the only reason she's being weird is because she's nervous about the fact that in the first week she's working on the FBI case. And this is another thing we bring up. While looking at the stone, let's zoom in a bit because we need to do this bigger. While looking at this stone, another thing, common thing that everyone forgot is dropped. All right? They're looking at the stone and they're staring at it. And Diana picks it up and says one simple line. It's a throwaway line, but it's a very important line. She mentions that this thing was stolen under her breath that it was stolen about a few weeks ago in a heist, in a random location. This mall scene is an off-screen continuation of Diana's investigation into a theft. The mall scene is not some random one-off. It's the end of an investigation that Diane has been going through this whole time. I rewounded the video. I had I paused it and I rewound it just to see it. And I laughed because that's amazing. And that's cues. Every single part of this 15 minutes is cues for you to pay attention to what Diana is saying and what every woman in the show is saying, which I feel like no one paid attention to, which is probably going to be the title of the story. How women should be seen, not heard. And I think that's all I've been hearing from critics about this movie. There's not enough action. There's too much dialogue. There's too much talking because the dialogue is important and it grounds the story. But you don't want to hear women, you just want to see them fight. Wow. And yeah, I'm telling you, this is a solid movie. It is great. Is it better than the first one? It's not as emotionally impacting, impactful as the first one, which is why you're upset. But is it a bad movie? Far from it. It's solid. So within the first 15 minutes, like I said, I know I'm talking too much about the 15 minutes, but this is really important what happens here. In the first 15 minutes, a bunch of things happen. We know that the mall, we know that someone hired someone to steal the, the stone a while ago, off screen a few weeks ago. The mall is just a the end game of this heist. In the middle of looking at it, both Barbara and Diana make their wish, as well as the guy with the coffee which I'm trying to figure out was the side effect to the cough, to the wish for the coffee was the fact that it was hot and he burned himself. I don't have the movie anymore, so I can't look at it, but maybe that's what happened. Both Barbara and Diana have make their wish. Now, this is important for what happens later. Their wishes is pre-Lord Wishes. This is important. Their wishes happen before Lord takes the, um, that's when Lord takes the, uh, the stone and becomes the stone itself. This is pre-Lord, remember that. So their wishes are slower as intended, right? Once we get into the actual problem of the story, we find, 
Once we get to the actual problem of the story, now we realize that the entire problem really is that Maxwell Lord is the one who orchestrated this entire heist. So, hey again, uh, internet problems. Yay, gotta love it. Uh, so, let's bring this back to the 15 minute mark, or to the second part of the act one. We know that Lord wants the stone and orchestrated the entire thing prior to the mall scene. So when he shows up, he's just instantly doing everything possible to get the stone. By the time we get to the 30 minute mark, ish, or in other words, the end of act one, Lord has weaseled, weaseled his way into getting the stone from Barbara. And now Lord is the stone with his wish. The problem, stop him. Now, again, paying attention to everyone else. By the time we get to, by the time we get to the end of act one, we're rolling into act two. Everyone on this picture, and even more, if you think of all the other villains, have turned into villains already. By the time they start act two, they're villains. Barbara is the only one who hasn't. We sidestep the trope for some reason, for a more compelling story. Some of you don't believe that. So back again. When we get to act two, everyone's gonna go in through the whole mess, right? This is the moment where everything kind of clicks. So by the time we get the 30 minute mark, Diana has met Steve. We got Diana and Steve. I'm gonna spell it wrong all the time. And Barbara and her powers. We also have Lord and his powers. Everyone's pretty much going through the same story, right? Actually, that said, let me readjust this. So we have Diane and Steve, Barbara on her powers, and Lord and his powers. Got it? This is where we're at right now when we get it, when we enter into act two. So as we follow these made these people's lives, everything's going through the what's going on moment, right? When Diana sees Steve for the first time, we do that whole spinny thing, right? In that spinny thing, what you don't realize is this is the stone doing its magic for everyone else see everyone sees the regular guy the stranger for diana now her vision only sees steve's and she re-emphasizes that in this beginning of act two act two is understanding That's all this is. This is the understanding it phase. Everyone's trying to understand what's going on, right? Diane and Steve, as much as she's enjoying this, and again, we get it. She slept with a guy without his consent. But what I want everyone to remember is there's another line she says, again, 
listen to the women in this movie. Okay. He says, this guy looks nice. And she's like, I only see you. That's how the magic works. For Diana, all she sees, hears, and everything is Steve. And Steve, yes, is possessing a guy. Ghost and all. The ghost of Steve is possessing a guy. That's it. For their whole story and this whole, this whole journey for them is why is this happening? And oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I'm kind of in euphoria right now and I love this moment. But we still have to figure out what's wrong. Barbara, her changes are still slowly happening. Um, but she's still messing with her powers. But also, she is still interacting with these, with these guys. Let me do it the other way. Barbara, while still understanding these powers, still hasn't really understood what's going on. Barbara is still interacting with Diane and Steve like coworkers. Coworkers? What? Not villains? Yeah, she's not a villain yet. She's a coworker still. She still has skills and she's, Diana is using her skills. She's questioning where the stone is, obviously. And this is that moment where Diana's like, where is the stone? Well, Max, our Lord. And she's like, oh my goodness, you don't get it. Because Diana doesn't want her to part of it, be part of it, right? And Diana doesn't realize, and uh, Barbara doesn't realize this yet. Lord is understanding his powers by playing with it. The little things, getting the little things out of the way the wall companies and everything else, right? That's what he's doing. He's playing with his new powers. By the end of act two, we realize that Diana knows that the stone itself, well, by the end of act two, we know, again, we know more things. Diana and Steve realize that Lord has done his homework. This isn't like a one whimsical, like one-off wish. He knows exactly what was gonna happen. He has the notes. He's been paying attention. He knows it all. He also knows how to fix it. This guy knew exactly what he was gonna do. And the moment he became the stone, he went according to his plan. That's it, that's how it went. Lord knows exactly what he's doing. Diana now knows that the stone is a God and now he needs to figure out more about it, right? So when we get into act two, um, we follow stories of these guys again. Diane and Steve now have to follow and uh, go ch uh, chase out the Lord, right? Oh, by the way, once Lord becomes the stone, his, his powers are immediate. It's not slow like the stone intended. The Lord is now the stone. He controls the speed of it. And he is, his powers are immediate like that. Hey, the 80s, it's about immediate consumption. Let's be real here. So it just plays into that idea of the 80s. He wants it now. He gets it now. Um, Diana and Steve uh, know what's going on and they fly to Lord who again is continuing his his need to uh, to consume, right? Barbara, on the other hand, is now playing with her powers, right? Um, one sec. Sorry about that. I had to get some stuff, get some pictures. All right, let's talk about airplanes for a second, because again, another contention. So. Uh, here is the interior of a German World War II plane, a World War I plane. Uh, not a lot, of, a lot of knobs and switches, but really we're still focusing on the fact that, uh, to be honest, we still have, um, I think that's the ignition. 
throttle all your cages you need to fly pedals stick got it good right this fuzzy thing is the interior of a f111 aardvark um Again, as much as we see all these instrumentations and everything, it still comes down to the fact that the pilot would just know on a whim all the instrumentations. If all you needed was an ignition, that's red. Just look for the red switch. That's the ignition. Throttle is the same just a little bit more advanced. And for those who don't understand it, this is a two seater. There's one seat and then two seats. Another thing we have to talk about, Diana stole a plane from the museum. Why do you think she'd buy, should steal a plane that was built in 84? The F-11 was made in the 60s. Chances are that's gonna be there. Also, our planes field, I don't know. But maybe if it was somewhere around the time of an air show, maybe they would, you know what I'm saying? I don't know air shows, I don't know how they do it but I'd feel that there's a lot of airplanes there from all the different eras that are worked on, taken care of and fueled to make sure that they run. So again, you're overthinking this for no reason. And I'm overthinking of it, they're overthinking it for you to remind you to stop doing that. Okay, so yes, two seater planes with tons of gauges that are kind of similar to this. A foreign person who doesn't know what a plane is would look at this and say, I don't know what's going on. A person who's a spy who knows how to steal every single plane, German, American, British, whatever, can easily walk into the, to this plane, say, okay, I kind of get what I'm looking at and play around and fiddle and get it to work. Yeah, he'll be a little freaked out by the jet. That's the one thing, I get it. But let's go back to the story, shall we? Try. Ugh. Okay. So do you still, they still claim go to uh, whatever Middle Eastern country uh, to stop Lord. Again, Lord's powers are immediate. Barbara is slowly turning evil, but is not evil yet. By the time we get here, again, she's calling Barbara. Again. Barbara, hey, have you figured out anything about the stone? Yeah, I figured something out. Barbara right now is still part of the team. Even though they're not together, they're still part of a team. They're working together. She's Diana values her knowledge and is using Barbara's knowledge, right? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, by the way, there's action here. Yay. I know we saw it in the theaters too, but sorry. Uh, By the time we get here to this point, the, uh, the act two C is how I call it. Uh, they've come back and Diana now figures out what the problem is. Full understanding now. Lord knows that he needs to completely um, he needs more people he needs more wishes to continuously heal his body because he knows what's happening to him. But again, everything in Act 2 is a Lord wish, not a stone wish. Difference. So we get to this point. 
Lord is now thinking, okay, I'm going to go bigger president, all this stuff. Right. Dan is like, oh no, we have to take out the stone, everything, blah, blah, blah. And when they're given a choice, she realized the only way she doesn't want to choose the right way. She wants to choose the easy way. Barbara on hearing this, again, part of the group. Barbara on hearing this finally becomes the villain. At the moment where she, Bar, uh, Diana was reading the book, they realized right there and then that to stop Lord, you have to stop the book. Diana is not willing to take the sacrifice. Uh, she, uh, Dan is not willing to sacrifice Steve. Done. Simple as that. Barbara, at the exact same time, is not willing to sacrifice her new powers. Done. Lord, I think at this point, has the problem with his kid. Kid. And he's not willing to sacrifice his powers to help his kid. This is about sacrifice. Okay. Barbara now becomes the villain. And at the very end of act two, Diana struggling to fight finally versus finally goes up against Barbara while trying to capture Lord. Right. This is where Barbara becomes a villain. She becomes a villain at the end of act two. Not at the beginning, not at the end of act one, but at the end of act two. Essentially, what Barbara is for most of the movie, and I seriously wish you all realized this, Barbara is short round. Diana is Indiana. I wish you guys can see that. <laughs> Diana is Indiana, and I can't remember her name, <laughs> but this is Steve. This is what we're watching. We're actually watching a short little adventure, uh, Indiana Jones adventure. An artifact is stolen. They go on the case to find the artifact against a villain who knows about the artifact and understands the artifact. Through their research and understanding of the artifact, they chase it down to multiple locations. And when finally presented with the real reality of it all, one of the, of the crew ditches it and goes evil. That never happened in Indiana Jones. Would have been an interesting story though. We're watching a superhero version of Indiana Jones. Got it? Whip and all. Funny, huh? When you think about it. So once we get to this point, everyone is now pre-established, is established. Barbara escapes with Lord after Lord learns about the satellite. After Lord learns about the satellite. I don't think that's how it was. I can't remember. And now that we jump into third act. Third act, Diana has to sacrifice. Diana gets rid of Steve. Barbara embraces that she hates being human and gets her second wish. Note, this is a Lord wish, separate from the original wish. So now she's adding an extra wish to it. And Lord, on unbeknownst reasons, is able to reach out across the world and give everyone wishes. Uh, 
Um, yes, the armor is stupid. Let's get that out of the way. The armor is stupid. She shouldn't be able to fly by this point. She should just get the armor and fly on her own. She fly with the armor. I think they rushed it. I enjoy the invisible jet. It needed to happen. But because we're in the 80s, Diana in the 80s didn't know how to fly in the show. So she should have just stuck with the plane. And that's it. Okay, good. Um, once we're past all this mess, uh, we have the Diana versus uh, Cheetah fight, which again, it wasn't done right. It should have been a little more colorful. It should have been more vibrant. She should have been more orange. There was better designs out there. And then when we get to Diana versus Lord, and to be honest, I'm gonna really be candid with you. The moment I saw that, the Diana pleading with Lord and everything, I laughed because I realized this feels like never ending story. If anyone has not seen the Ronnie story, please go watch it. It's great. Uh, but there's an end moment where um, the Ivory Princess is calling to Sebastian to join him, to join her. It's the please do this. And he's like, I can't. I have to keep my feet on the ground, blah, 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 blah moment. And this is a shot to shot back and forth between these two are uh, talking. And it's high climactic moment. And for some reason, I saw that. I saw Lord as Sebastian saying, I don't want to give it up. And I saw Diana as the Ivory Princess saying, you need to, or you'll lose everything. I don't know why that popped in my head. And I think that's just kind of the funniest thing ever. But I love that, that I did that. I thought that, and it worked. Most of you don't know the movies. movies. Most of you guys are young, so you don't know any of this stuff. Uh, so you choose what's immediate around you and you don't understand the broader scope of movies that are out there. So a lot of this is really a lot of 80s stuff. Watch a lot of 80s stuff, they're good. Um, but um, something you, will, you guys are all pay, not paying attention to, okay? A lot of comments say, when Lord loses his powers, what's stopping everyone else from their wishes? Lord is. Lord's entire purpose was to be the wishing stone. To stop the wishes, you destroy the wishing stone. Got it? When Lord gives up his powers, I renounce my wish. He announces the, renounces the wishes of everyone that's under him, his influence. He renounced his wish. He destroyed the stone by, by destroying the link between him and the stone. That's it. Diana didn't even need to have everyone else to renounce it. She just needed Lord to renounce his wish. And by renouncing his wish, it destroys every other wish under him. Any wish within act two is now gone. Which now poses one fun little theory and fun little thing I think we could do. Because by the end of act, by the time he finishes his wish, Barbara's not Cheetah anymore. But we also didn't hear Barbara renounce her wish. So technically, her wish pre Lord is still active. And this is how we could get Barbara into the third movie. You can have a cheetah again. So the internet's being stupid because of the storm. Um, and I tried to do something, but it just messed everything up. So let's just end it now. So in conclusion, um, you're not paying attention to Wonder Woman. You're not listening to anyone that's in the movie. Everything's clear, concise, and good. Uh, yeah, it's got some problems. Yeah, the whole like sleeping with uh, Steve is kind of a problem too, but let's be real. 
everything else is just nitpicking to the point where it's just exhausting. Is it great? Probably not. But it's a solid good movie. There's no need for the hate. I don't understand it. I don't get it. And you guys are reaching for straws at this point. Um, but again, can uh, Cheetah come back for Wonder Woman 3? Yeah, possible. And what you can easily do is just, oh, actually to fix some of the problems, all you really can do is just say, start off Wonder Woman 3 with, with uh, Barbara actually acknowledging that Barbara did date the guy that Steve was. Throw his name in there. Maybe she finally moved on and that's the guy she started dating. Um, then introduce the fact that uh, now we continue the Indiana Jones kind of joke, the arc uh, for in Diana. <laughs> um, with now Barbara, again, we've already said that she's competent for the entire thing, but now she's not confident. Um, and have her pin, uh, pinned with uh, Diana more as both physical adversary. Because again, in this idea, what if Barbara still had her powers because it's pre, pre Maxwell Lord wish and she didn't give it up, so the powers are still there. Um, I don't know, we'll figure out a loophole on that one. Um, so they both have the same powers. She lives forever now, just like Diana. You could just have it where she reveled in that idea of the, the powers. So she's just seeking out a new way of turning into Cheetah again. That's their movie. Another artifact story of, about gods where Diana is trying to stop um, Barbara from getting the ability to turn into Cheetah again or something like that. And just make Cheetah turn in faster and then throw an extra villain in there maybe, yeah, something like that. Um, or maybe it could just be a Diana, a Diana Barbara story. No more men. It could just be the story of two successful women going on an archaeological uh, archaeological adventure, finding God stuff. Simple as that. I don't know. Well, I'm gonna be done. I don't want the internet to go out again or something dumb like that. So next time we'll probably talk about rewriting some other movie. So see you.